Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration, and information on writing, publishing options, and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint, and lots more information at thecreativepen.com. And that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello, creatives. I'm Joanna Penn, and this is episode number 626 of the podcast, and it is Friday the 3rd of June 2022 as I record this. On today's show, I talk to Eric Otis Simmons about getting your book into libraries as a self-published author. I am passionate about libraries, and it's one of the reasons I publish wide with all formats – as if you are exclusive, your books won't be in libraries. So if you want to help authors and still get your books for free, you can request them from your library service. And more tips coming up in the interview section with Eric. So in publishing and book marketing news, uh, not much going on, but there have been some reports on various sites and Facebook groups that books2read.com is not being supported anymore. But this is a false rumour. So I wanted to bring it up. It's one of those things that seems to have gone round the various sites. And it's not true. Books2read.com is alive and kicking, absolutely supported by draft to digital If you don't know what it is, essentially, you can create one link with all your wide links, including all different formats of your book, multiple ebook, print and audiobook stores, all shareable from one link. So uh, check it out, books2read.com. And uh, yeah, I personally find it super useful and wanted to just make sure everyone knows it's still useful. Lindsay Baroka did a lovely thread on Twitter, which I wanted to share. Now she's not doing the Six Figure Author podcast anymore. Uh, It's good to share the Lindsay wisdom now and then. (laughs) So she says, I'm not reading all of it, just some of it. But she says, it's hard not to have any expectations when you publish your first book or your 20th. But the more certain you are that it's going to be a life changing success, the more you're setting yourself up for disappointment. It's hard to recover from the disappointments and keep going. But if you publish with low expectations, maybe someday, if I keep publishing stories that people like over enough years, maybe I'll slowly build up a fan base and start to make some money at this. It's easier. Give yourself a modest and achievable goal to keep working toward. When you make that goal, maybe you set another modest and achievable one. Lindsay says, when I published my first book, Emperor's Edge, I barely sold any copies. Let's count them on fingers. Toes won't be required. A couple of years and six novels and a number of short stories and novellas later, I got to the point of modest day job income. That was 2012. I have been a full-time author since then, but it took time for readers to find my work and I have published a lot of books over the last 11 years. I think Lindsay's got over 80 books, possibly even towards 100 and she writes in the fantasy. So she writes like 100,000 word plus books. (laughs) She's got so many now. (laughs) But as she says, it's very rare for someone in any industry to become successful overnight. Having high expectations and letting yourself keep getting disappointed makes it hard to stick with it long enough to get there. A lot of people stop along the way, sometimes just short of when they might have had that one book that acted as a turning point. Don't have crazy expectations. Be in it for the long haul. You got this. So I obviously I agree with that. I also don't know that you even need one book that is a turning point. (laughs) I've never had a breakout success. I personally, I've got what, 30 plus books now. And uh, I've I've podcasted a lot more than Lindsay. (laughs) So uh, yes, I'm trying not to compare myself with her, but you know, regular listeners will know I often do. Um, But yes, uh, I think this is important. And I actually had an email, I wanted to share this because I had an email from an author recently who said, that she tried all these different marketing things, but she wasn't making a living. She was very despondent. But I had a look and she only had three books and they weren't even aimed at the same audience and they weren't in genres that sell very much anyway. And she had focused on the marketing side, but without having the craft and of course the big backlog, which is what so many of us make a living from. And in fact, traditional publishing makes their most of their money from the backlist now. This is a big change from the pandemic. So 
yeah, it's focusing. Of course, you have to focus on all these things, <laughs> but there's almost no point in marketing until you've got a few books. This is a long game. And uh, I wanted to also remind people about the metaphor of the magic bakery. And Dean Wesley Smith has talked about this on his show, um, sorry, his <laughs> his website. He also has a book called The Magic Bakery. And he was on this show a few years back talking about it. But essentially, the concept of the magic bakery is that each book is a pie in your shop. Let's imagine you have a pie shop and each book is a pie. Now, the, the concept is really about the magic of copyright, the fact that you can license slices of the pie in so many ways. And it's kind of magic because you can slice it infinite numbers of ways and the slices keep coming back to you, which is why it's so magic. For example, you might do a foreign rights deal for 10 years and then the slice comes back to you and then you can relicense it. But Dean also talks about the number of pies in the shop. No one can run a pie shop business with only one type of pie because some customers won't like that pie. So you need some others. (laughs) You get the metaphor, right? And if you don't like pies, think about cakes or whatever. You can't have a shop with just one product. This is kind of fundamental. And it's fundamental to the author business if you want a business as an author, you need more than just one product. And that gives the customer choice. It gives you different ways to make a living. You can bundle things. You can change prices. You can you can just do so much more when you have more of an inventory. And yeah, I know it's annoying if you're at the beginning, but believe me, I used to think it was annoying. <laughs> And uh, all these years later, I get it. So yeah, don't worry if you keep creating, even if it's annoying now, you'll get it later on. So in my personal update, we've just come back from a lovely week in Rhodes, which is the Greek island that is furthest east, really closest to Turkey and Israel. And it was Jonathan's birthday and he requested a resort holiday, not my usual type of thing. I usually can't sit still for that long, but I read nine books (laughs) while I was away (laughs) and managed to sneak in a visit to Rhodes Old Town, which has ancient Greek, Roman, Byzantine, Christian, Ottoman and Italian uh, various forms of architecture and development and the palace of the Grand Master of the Knights of Rhodes was grand indeed and uh, I visited the statue of Laocon who I put in which is um, he he wrestles the sea serpents and I put that statue and that palace in end of days so it was nice to visit there I hadn't been there before. We also visited the ancient Greek Acropolis of Lindos and uh, you can see photos on my Instagram and my Facebook at jfpenauthor. I've also been working on my Shopify store since I've been back. More on that as I work through it all. I'm very, very excited. If this feels like the thing I wanted when I was looking at the crowdfunding and I was just like, oh, it just doesn't sit well with me to do this spike in effort and then to not have it all keep going. Like I don't like things that spike and drop off. What I like is long-term build that has a sort of sustainable income for the long term. I do not like launch spikes or any of that. I just like long-term. The relaxed author, (laughs) the relaxed author will need a new, a new, um, chapter or something at some point once I figure this all out. But anyway, I've been working on this Shopify store. I have an interview coming with Katie Cross, who is selling that way primarily. And um, I mean, basically, I've been selling direct since 2008 in various forms on various websites. But it's always been secondary. So I've always focused on other stores first and selling direct second, whereas Katie's turned that upside down and now sells direct first and all the stores are secondary income. And so that's what I want to do. I want to turn it around. So we're talking about that. That's coming up uh, the in-between episode in a week or so, week and a half as this goes out. On writing things, I'm waiting to get how to write a novel back from my editor. Then I'll be into finishing energy, which are the final edits, the audiobook narration, formatting. I've got to record some new tutorials that go with the book and obviously publishing stuff. And I am planning, the reason I'm focusing on the Shopify store is because I'm planning on selling direct in all formats, all print, uh, ebook and audiobook direct for a month before putting it on the stores. So I'm trying to get both ready at the same time. I want to essentially flip the model uh, completely so that I get the 94% royalty income (laughs) straight away rather than it 
uh, going into big companies' pockets for 60 to 90 days and then arriving in my account later, uh, much less royalty as well. So, yeah, and I'm not saying I'm, I'm definitely not stopping everywhere. You know, I publish wide, wide. I am super wide with everything, uh, pretty much everything. And I... Uh, but what I want to do is just change the model, flip the model around, still be everywhere, but make sure it comes into my pocket first. So more on that as that develops. On fiction, one of my short stories, The Dark Queen, which is about a dive on an ancient Egyptian archaeological site off the coast of Alexandria, is in a new anthology called Into the Briny Deep, available now if you enjoy short stories set in the sea with all kinds of monsters, and mine, of course, as usual, is a supernatural thing. Check it out in all the usual places. Links in the show notes. That is called Into the Briny Deep, and it is a short story anthology. Also, I have finished the books and travel episode on thoughts on traveling to the USA again and the differences between our cultures because I was in Arizona last month and America felt like a foreign country again uh, after not visiting for years. So I wanted to capture some of the differences before I just get so used to it again because I know that's going to happen. Uh, I'll be hopefully, fingers crossed, coming to Las Vegas for 20 books, Vegas in November. And I'm at Superstars of Writing in Colorado Springs in February. So I know that after I've been back in America and traveling lots in there, I'll just be so used to it all again. So it was really interesting to notice things on this trip. And so I have put that on my books and travel podcast. Wherever you are listening to this, you can find books and travel with me, except I'm Joe Francis Penn over there. (laughs) show notes at booksandtravel.page and I'm really interested to hear what you think about it. I know many of you, the majority of listeners are American and of course I love Americans, I love America. All countries have their issues so don't worry, Uh, I understand your issues. We also have issues, different issues. (laughs) But anyway, I hope it doesn't offend anyone but I just, I wanted to capture some thoughts. So that's on my books and travel show. Also in futurist stuff, I had to bring this up because the ABBA Voyage concert has been getting rave reviews here in the UK. Basically, it's performed by avatars, or they're calling them avatars. Ha ha ha. Uh, basically, ABBA as they were in the late 1970s. This is AR, augmented reality, but you don't have to wear a headset. The avatars are digitally added to the real world. They've built a special stage and everything. And I know someone who went to the concert and they were close enough to see these avatars. And he said he couldn't tell. They weren't real people. They interacted with the crowd. You could see skin through mesh clothing. They moved around each other um, and spun around. And it was completely realistic, except that another part of your brain knew that ABBA are old now. (laughs) But uh, the creation process is really interesting. There's loads of articles about this, but essentially the ABBA band members wore motion capture suits as part of the development process and they were filmed as they performed a 22 song set over the course of five weeks. Some 160 cameras were used with graphics later added by Industrial Light and Magic which is owned by Lucasfilm and they've used obviously they use this in film already. The digital band is accompanied by a live band on stage which adds to the energy and of course as I said they built a special arena for it to manage all of these cameras now we've already seen avatars bringing dead actors back to life in film but this is proving to be a real hit so I'm pretty sure we're going to see more of this personally I would love to see Queen in concert with Freddie Mercury uh reborn as such so we we will we will see but i it's so interesting to me because i had assumed that the ar the augmented reality side would be um facilitated by a headset or i mean you can do i've talked a lot about the phone in fact while we were in greece uh we used the google translate app which you can just hold over things so when there was um in a museum there was text in greek and you just hold the google translate camera over the uh, text in greek and you can read in English on the phone. It's that real-time translation in the app. And uh, so that's the the phone and glasses when they arrive. But yeah, this is augmented reality with no headset. So fascinating times we live in for sure. 
So thanks for all your emails and tweets and comments over the last few weeks. Thanks to Amanda, who sent me some pictures from a graveyard in Heartland, Wisconsin, in the USA. And to William, who sent pictures from the farm. He said, I was listening to you this morning as I checked on the sheep. Clement, my co-writer dog, adopted this two-day-old lamb. Thank you so much for the lovely pictures. Uh, James Felix commented about uh, Tammy Lebrecht's interview on email list, said, this was a good listen, got me motivated to do something about my email list. Thanks. And Let Freedom Ring on YouTube said, I have been shy about starting an email list, so I need all the advice and tips I can get. Thank you. And on being shy, uh, you, you, <laughs> you have to remember you're not forcing yourself on people. You're, you're putting an offer out there and people will sign up if they want to. And if they don't want to, they just unsubscribe. Not a big deal. It's really low key. So you don't need to be shy. You just put it out there. And when you email people, you just be yourself. Also, lots of you commented and tweeted about the AI narration episode. Uh, So I'll just read one of them. Kevin McGill says, both AI readings sounded great, but I was gobsmacked at how good the fiction sounded. I was immediately transported into the story, even though there were no accents or dramatic inflections. And that, that no accents or dramatic inflection, that's just a straight read. And plenty of normal narrators do a straight read. You don't need to do accents or inflections with fiction. It's just a straight read. So yeah, it depends on what you like. So as ever, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen. Send me pictures of where you're listening to the show. Email me, joanna at thecreativepen.com or leave a comment on the blog or the YouTube channel. I love to hear from you. It makes this more of a conversation. So today's show is sponsored by Ingram Spark. Very appropriate as you can use Ingram Spark to get your print books into libraries. And you cannot get into libraries if you just use KDP Print for your print books because you can't offer discounts and you won't appear in library catalogues. So I use Ingram Spark to print and distribute my self-published print books wide because with Ingram Spark, it's my content, but they help me do more with it. You will have access to over 40,000 retailers, independent bookstores, libraries, schools and universities, chain bookstores and more across a global network of distributors, including bookstores like Foils, Blackwells and Waterstones in the UK, Bookshop.org, which has become very popular in the pandemic, Walmart, Target and loads of independent stores in the USA, Booktopia in Australia and New Zealand, Chapters Indigo in Canada and many more. Of course, it means your book will be available to order, but you will still have to drive demand. But since having my books on Ingram Spark, I've had many of you send pictures of my print books in libraries, and I've also sold them at book fairs, conventions, and in physical stores. You can choose to use returns, but it's not necessary, and I don't use returns personally. You can also choose your discount percentage. You can also bulk order, and you can do this in different places in the world. So, for example, when bookstores have emailed me to order books, I will order it from the Ingram plant that's nearest them. I don't need to ship it from the UK. There's also plants in different places around the world, so that's super useful. And I know many of you work direct with bookstores, with schools, maybe you do speaking. So yes, it all works very well. So if you want your print books in libraries, as well as everywhere else, go wide with your print books. It's your content. Do more with it. Head on over to ingramspark.com. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time as ever is sponsored by my wonderful patrons and especially the extra shows that I do, the in between episodes. Thank you to all of you who are still supporting the show after many years and many months. You are all amazing. I know it's tough times and uh, a lot of people have dropped off recently, but luckily new patrons keep arriving too. So thank you so much to this week, Harley King, Randy Green, Karen, Julia R, Juliet Freyamuth and Sally Trufen. Thanks as ever to everyone and if you find the show useful you can support the show with just a few of whatever currency you would like (laughs) to use and you will get the extra monthly Q&A audio where I answer questions from patrons. Support the show at patreon.com p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen. Right Let's get into the interview. Eric Otis Simmons is the author of the memoir, Not Far From the Tree, and books for authors, including Getting Your Books Into Libraries. 
He's the CEO of ESE Inc., which builds custom websites. And he's also a speaker on diversity, equity and inclusion. So welcome to the show, Eric. Joanna, thank you so much for having me today. Oh, I'm excited to talk to you about this. But before we get into libraries, tell us a bit more about you and how you got into writing. It's an interesting story, Joanna. I grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas and Montgomery, Alabama, which I view as two of the leading central uh, civil rights hotbeds here in America. So most of my schooling, I was a year or two away from schools being integrated. And in addition to that, when I joined corporate America, where I spent 30 years in sales and sales management for some of the most admired companies in the world, such as IBM, AT&T, GE, and others, I generally was the first Black male to work in the positions that I was in. And at MCI, I also sold internationally where I closed in Brussels, a $1 million sale, in Paris, a half million dollar sale, and in Hong Kong, a $25 million sale. So when I would share snippets of information with coworkers and family and friends about my life, I would constantly get feedback that, hey, you've got to write a book. So after 12 years of procrastination, I finally sat down and wrote my memoir, Not Far From the Tree, and I self-published it. So it was the encouragement of others that led me to get into writing. Mm. When did you self-publish that? Uh, I released my memoir in May of 2017. So this is its fifth year anniversary. That's brilliant. And it's so interesting that you, do you mind me asking what age bracket you are, just so people get that? Oh, that's fine. I'm, I'm in my early 60s. No, I think well that just to get the time frame because you mentioned there being involved in civil rights and obviously it's still a critically important area, but equally like you said, so many years in corporate America. And I said to you before we started recording, you're so organised. And one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you is because you've been super organised about marketing to libraries and getting your book into libraries and helping authors with that. So uh, yeah. let's get into libraries. So first of all, why should authors even consider thinking about getting their books into libraries? Why is it important? Well, there are a number of factors, Joanna, that go beyond just the prestige of getting one's book into a library. For me, as a self-publisher, getting my book into libraries serves as validation that I've written a quality piece of work. But in addition to that, I'm because of my, my, my corporate background, I'm into numbers. I'm into data that can confirm things for me. So when I look at the library market, there are over 2.6 million libraries worldwide. And they spend about $31 billion annually. In addition to that, of that $31 billion, about $1.4 billion is spent on books. So that represents a significant market for all of us as uh, self-publishing houses and self-publishers. Another area that's important, I believe, that our listeners should consider is libraries are excellent references for other libraries. And what I mean by that, if you're able to get your book in one library and you let another library know about it, your chances go up, I believe, dramatically in terms of being able to get your book into follow-on libraries. There's statistics that show that every happy reader of a book in a library tells five other people. That's another consideration. And then when you look at the different age brackets, anywhere from millennials to baby boomers to no matter what age bracket you look at, if you can can get your book into a library, there's a good chance that that reader is going to buy that book. And in addition, if you have multiple books as an author in libraries, millennials are more than 70% likely to buy your follow-on books. So there's just a number of reasons and data supports it, in my opinion, for us to all consider libraries as a very viable market for our self-published works. 
Mm, absolutely. And then I want to add the accessibility angle as well. I mean, as we're di- discussing this in May 2022, there's inflation, the cost of living is increasing. And I think people will be needing libraries more than ever. And it's not just print books, is it? It's ebooks, it's audio books that people can get from their libraries online as well as in person. My mum was a single mum and we were on benefits for a while and I grew up in the library. That's where I got books from. So I almost feel like it's important that we almost pay it forward to people and have our books available to those readers who just can't get them any other way. I mean, what what do you think about that? No, I, I totally agree with you. And even with the pandemic, it doesn't look like library traffic has slowed down. During the height of the pandemic, libraries were still offering services and they began to use tools like Zoom to provide, they call them programming. Uh, I view those as just events that are offered by libraries. But no, I totally, I agree with you wholeheartedly, Joanne. Mm, Actually, that's a really good point because if uh, one of the issues that people have with libraries is, oh, they want me to go and do an event in person, but I have to travel and I won't get paid and it will be too expensive. But if you're doing something over Zoom, then actually more authors can probably get involved with those types of programming for different libraries, right? That's what a lot of um, children's authors are doing too in schools. So probably the same with libraries. Right. Actually, when libraries shut down across the globe during the height of the pandemic, one of my strategies was actually reaching out to libraries and say, hey, as a part of your programming to continue to provide services to your patrons, I'm willing to offer at no charge a Zoom video conference to share how I self-published my book, or I could talk about my memoir. And during the pandemic, I actually did a reading of my memoir. First time I'd ever done one, ever, even not even in person had I done one. I did it via Zoom. It went over incredibly well. And then I talked about self-publishing with several other libraries. So I was staying busy with my library marketing during the height of the pandemic, and I was getting my books in the libraries during that time. Yeah. And I actually think you probably stand out more than a load of authors who just exist as books, because once you're a real person and they see you and they listen to you and they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that author. I'll recommend the book more. Right. Yeah, that's a great point. You're right. You're absolutely right. And And, and it's so funny during one of my Zoom uh, conferences with a library in Pennsylvania, the librarian told the audience there were about 20 people on the Zoom conference. And he said, the reason why I bought Eric's book was I noticed another library that I'm familiar with. And I figured if they bought it, well, then it's good enough for me. So libraries make for good references to my earlier point. That, very good. Oh, well, in that case, librarians, if you're listening, <laughs> you can get either Eric or me <laughs> to speak <laughs> virtually at your library. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I hadn't even thought about that. OK, so circling back to you mentioned 1.4 billion spent by librarians on books. So uh, let's talk about how, as self-published authors, we can make our va- our books available to libraries because the librarian doesn't go on Amazon and buy a book, do they? How do they find the different books? That, that's a great point. When I first started marketing to libraries, I couldn't figure out why I wasn't getting my foot into the door. And to your point, not a lot of libraries buy from Amazon. And that surprised me with Amazon being the world's largest online bookstore. But what I came to learn, libraries use other sources to acquire their books, one of which and probably the leading source is Ingram, I-N-G-R-A-M. And Ingram has a platform similar to KDP, and it's called Ingram Spark. And then there are other distributors that libraries buy from uh, on, for paperbacks, such as Blurb. Well, Blurb actually distributes through Ingram. So that those are two that I use for my paperbacks, Ingram and Blurb. And then for my ebooks, I've seen librarians buy from Draft to Digital, Smashwords, Street Lib, and Publish Drive. Now, Publish Drive is interesting because they are using a company called Hoopla. And Hoopla is a competitor of Overdrive, which for years has been the primary ebook source for libraries. But what's important about Hoopla, I kind of view them as the Netflix of libraries because they offer video, audio, 
as well as eBooks. And Hoopla uses a different model. They're using something called a paper checkout model, which means, uh, Joanna, for your listeners, is that let's say your book is selling for $10. Well, instead of the library buying that book at, at the retail or at, at a discounted price, they are paying when you check out the book, when someone che- or one of their patrons checks out the book. So if it's a $10 book, you might get paid one-tenth of that or $1 for that checkout. And that counts as a library sale. So they're using a little bit different model. But yeah, there are other companies out there that libraries look at much more so than they do Amazon to acquire their books. Absolutely. And um, just to add there, so draft to digital also distribute to Hoopla. So uh, there's definitely overlap in all these services. Mm-hmm. Smashwords is now owned by draft to digital <laughs> right. um, or they merged. And Overdrive is also owned by the sister company to Kobo. So if you go direct to Kobo Writing Life, you'll also be in Overdrive. So uh, what I tend to think is just overlap them. <laughs> Yeah, correct. <laughs> you know, yeah. if you try and figure out how to just not avoid uploading twice, it doesn't work. So yeah, I upload to a lot of these services and end up on all of them somehow. But as you say, what happens is, um, well, how I believe it happens is either the librarian will find out in some way and we'll talk about marketing, but also a, a library right. patron can suggest a book and that will be ordered into the ebook catalog or the print catalog or the audio catalog. So that's another thing, isn't it? Is to ask our readers to record quest our books in libraries. That's a great point, Joanna, because librarians weigh heavily their patrons in particular books. That's a great point that you make. So yeah, you're right. I would encourage us to, uh, yeah, have patrons recommend our books to libraries. That's a great point. And as you mentioned, we still get paid. So the reader gets it for free and we still get paid either because the library bought it or because they have a paper checkout. So like to me, it's amazing. So that's ebooks and print books. And of course, authors can get their audio books into libraries through Findaway Voices, who also have a similar thing where you can get paid per checkout or the library can buy the audio book. So basically you can get into your li- into libraries with all these different formats. But of course, just because things are available, it doesn't mean that the library just know it exists. So what are some ways that you've been pitching libraries with your books? Several ways, as I mentioned earlier, Zoom video conferencing. But the primary method, Joanna, I've been using has been emailing. When I first started out, I I was calling libraries by phone. I had a little plan that I had put together and I had my little voice script. And after about three telephone calls, librarians kept telling me, please uh, send me some information over. Your book sounds great, but I'd like to learn more. And so that's where I decided or when I decided to go the email route. And one of the things strategically that I knew or I felt would be important was I didn't want to send spam like emails. I didn't want to send flyers. So what I ended up doing was constructing customized emails where I include not only the librarian's name, but the library, perhaps in the body of the document. And that then that email document became more, it was a metadata, what I call sales sheet. It was informational from the standpoint that it had the ISBN of my book or books. It had my book cover. It had a synopsis or a description about the book. And it had who you could buy the book from. So it it became, and it was a document, but technically, if you peel back the onion, it was really my metadata. And I just learned how to construct it in a way that I felt would be reader friendly, that a librarian could pick up and get most of the information that they would need to make an informed decision as to whether or not they wanted to buy the book. And I also spent anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes trying to construct my subject line. So I put almost as much time into the subject line to get the librarian to open up the email as I spent developing the internal email itself. So did you uh, send that as like an attachment or because attachments get lost in spam a lot, did you put it all in the body? Just in the body. I never send attachments to your point because A librarian is getting a strange email and with an attachment. Well, a lot of people might think an attachment would create spam or a virus. 
So no, I do not use attachments at all. Oh, I think that's a really good point. So when you're pitching your book, so it's mainly your memoir, right? Not Far From the Tree. So Well, actually, what, yeah. I, have, I have four other titles, but I really only pitched the three others. And uh, that was one would be getting your book into libraries. And then I have two other books, one on self-publishing and then a combination book that includes how to get started self-publishing and, and then here's a market that you can go to, which are libraries. So I combined two books into one. Mm. Well, and I, think, I did that, mm. Joanne, I, I, and this is called, you know, when you asked me about my marketing, this was a marketing and a strategic idea that I had. With the pandemic, there was information coming out that librarians' budgets would be cut. And so I said, well, they might not be able to afford two of my books separately, so why not combine them into one? And that's what I did. No, I think that's really interesting. And so you're putting all of that in the email and you're putting the name of the librarian and the particular library. So this is where your incredible sales background comes in. But how did you find the information on the librarian and the names of people particularly? That That's a great question. It was manual. If you were to Google top 100 libraries in the United States, the American Library Association will have a listing. Well, I took that listing, copy and pasted it into a, an Excel spreadsheet, which became my library contacts database, which now has over 6,000 librarian contacts. And then I had to go and search each library and try to find what I thought was their highest level decision makers. And in some libraries that if they are very large, I went directly after the CEO. I was mailing to the CEO of the Atlanta Public Library here in Atlanta. And so that's how I went about it. I also discovered there are some states that actually have lists that are in Excel spreadsheets or Uh, And so I was able to use those. Most were outdated. So I had to do some updating. And then the third area was some libraries have PDFs of their librarians. And that's more of a nightmare because you're copying and pasting and and it takes forever to do. But honestly, that's how I did it, because I was so determined to get my books in the libraries. I felt I needed a resource that I could pull from so that I could be able to send custom emails to 100 librarians if I wanted to or to 300. I never do more than 300 because then it begins to become unwieldy. Mm. So subsequently, through the course of a year, I can email libraries quarterly, and I'm constantly keeping my books in front of librarians, and I'm constantly generating sales that way. I I love that. I think it's so brilliant. We'll talk about your resources in a minute. But you've mentioned, I mean, obviously you're in the USA and you are American, but what about international libraries? Because of course, like we mentioned Overdrive, for example, they have libraries all all over the world. So have you thought about the international side? Yeah, I actually have, Joanna. And I try to incorporate the similar Google search strategy that I did here in the US to look for lists of librarians that I could mail. And when I did that, I just, I didn't know the international market well enough to begin to figure out, okay, how can I do a Google search to maybe find similar lists? But I actually did make that attempt. And so what my thought process is, if someone were to use the tools that I've developed, and if they were just to spend a little bit of time, I believe something similar can be done in the UK or internationally. But I did make an attempt, but I just wasn't able to replicate internationally what I've been able to do here in the US. Yeah, well, I think I certainly think this is something that is worth doing, especially coming back to the Zoom programming, because when I said to you when we got on the phone, I love your voice. And part of the reason I love your voice and part of the reason Americans always say to me, oh, I love your voice is because they're different from our voices. (laughs) (laughs) And so if you speak to an audience in the UK, you Mm -hmm. are fundamentally more interesting (laughs) Okay, than, okay. than someone who's got an accent like mine. And the same, if I speak to a library um, in Atlanta, for example, I bet you I'm more interesting because they're like, oh, I love listening to your voice. <laughs> That's a great point, Joanna. Yeah, so I, I actually, you know, as I think through that question, if any of your listeners on this podcast 
would want to try to begin developing a library context database internet for international use, I'd be more than willing to invest a little time with that person or persons to see if we can't come up with something similar, because it would be beneficial to us all, I believe. Yeah, absolutely. Well, tell us about your resources that you have available to people. I, I use a number of resources, and, and let me tell you what my resources are kind of geared to do. Each library has what's called a collection development policy. And those are the rules and guidelines by which libraries acquire books. So I'm trying to gear my books towards those interest areas, if you will, that libraries have in their guidelines that patrons will come in and subsequently check out a book on. So I'm using resources to support that endeavor. I use very heavily this database, this Excel spreadsheet that I've created called my library contacts database. I also use the methodology that I've written down in my book, Getting Your Book Into Libraries. That's a resource for your podcast listeners. You've also posted two of my articles, How to Get Your Book Into Libraries and Get Your Book Into Libraries. Those are additional resources for others, but I've used those resources myself (laughs) because Mm. I guess I created them. Uh, Other things I do, I use Google to do research on topics that I feel might be of interest to librarians. As an example, I recently did a mailing to promote my self-publishing works, and I found some interesting data uh, that self-publishing has grown 275% over the last five years. And I in, I input little bullet points that I found about the growth of self-publishing into the body of my email to try to create and generate interest. I also use WorldCat as a resource to determine which libraries have purchased my book. WorldCat is the world's uh, largest online catalog where members of a group called the Online Computing Center, which supports WorldCat. These are librarians that when your book goes into a library, they add it. And so 30% of my library sales are in WorldCat. So I go on to WorldCat, which is uh, www.worldcat.org as a resource. I use libraries' websites as resources to update my database when there's a new head librarian that may come in or one has retired. Another resource that I use are distributor sales reports. I use Amazon, Ingram, and those sales reports to give me ideas about my library sales following one of my email campaigns. And and what I do is I have an idea about how much I sell through Amazon monthly, I have an idea of what what I've got coming through Ingram Spark as an example. And when I see spikes in sales right after an email campaign, I'm about 80%, 80% of the time they're library sales. So I use KDP sales reports as well. So these are just some of the resources that I use to help me in my library marketing endeavors. But people can buy these resources from you, right? That is correct. Yeah. They can buy them through my website. The books are available through Amazon and over 50 other booksellers, but that is correct, Joanna. Yeah. And I think that's amazing. (laughs) So I just want to come back to, you mentioned there finding things that the librarians would be interested in, news items about self-publishing, for example. And that to me is exactly what you would do with a press release, which is one of the Ah. fundamental problems with with many authors is they think writing a book is news, but it's not. It needs to be related to what the target market wants. And so what you've Mm -hmm. done with that pitch email is you Mm -hmm. haven't just said, hey, here's my book. What you've said, is this is why you're interested and my book answers that question right that is that's perfect joanna that's right the way i view it is before i send out that email i'm trying to put myself in the librarian seat that that i think is critical when you're marketing anything to someone that doesn't know you or is unfamiliar with your product so what i'm trying to do and i read my emails before i send them out i'm trying to put myself in that librarian seat so if it's you joanna 
when I finish writing this customized email, I'm trying to envision myself as Joanna and I'm saying, okay, I'm Joanna. I'm reading this from an unknown person. Let me read this and let me see what he's saying here. And I'm trying to ensure or try, I'm doing my best to try to cause that reader to want to buy. Because my saying is, I've got one opportunity to impress and I need my email to be such that the librarian will say yes. So how do you pitch your memoir? Because nonfiction books on a useful topic, I feel, are much easier to pitch. How are you pitching your memoir? That's a great question. What I try to do, again, I'm thinking about where the book might fit, either with their patrons or in a library, but particularly with their patrons. So what I would pitch not far from the tree for is a library's sociology section. And then I may mention diversity and inclusion as a book. My book would be a great resource for that, should your patrons have an interest. And then also, Joanna, I also ask for the business in my emails. I would say something like, uh, Miss Penn, it would be a tremendous honor to have Not Far From the Tree added to your library's collection. And then at the end of my email, I would say, I look forward to your prospective order. Oh, nice. (laughs) I do a soft ask for the business. And I think that's where a lot of people may miss the mark. They may put together a good document for the librarian to read, but they're not asking for the business. But a soft ask is okay. I don't do a hard ask. I don't say you absolutely have to buy my book. It's the best in the world. I don't do that. (laughs) It's a very soft ask for the business. And I think that's an approach uh, for your audience to consider. Ask for the business, but ask for it softly. Yeah. And that's, I mean, as we said, you have years of decades of sales experience. This is all brilliant stuff, actually. Uh, I feel like this is one of the issues we have. And I also feel like so much of book marketing now, we're just talking about ads on Amazon and click this link. And what you're doing is actually really different to what most people are doing now. Um, I'm being being proactive, Joanna. I didn't mm. mean to cut you off. I'm being proactive. And, and the reason why, and, and it's really interesting, I did not want to pay $450 for a Kirkus review. And libraries like to have reviews if they can find them from Library Journal, Kirkus, uh, Kirkus, Publishers Weekly, and the like. So I really stepped out on a limb because I had so much confidence that I believed I'd written a quality piece of work. I felt I could get in my get my foot in the door if I marketed my book professionally to a librarian. I took a chance and the chance paid off. And then, of course, as you said, it it spills into other sales as readers discover you. And and, and libraries Mm -hmm. are incredible ecosystems, really. And I think they're becoming more ecosystems for for writers groups and different readers groups and crafting things and children's stuff. And so I think we've got to think far more broadly about what the library is. It's almost like a community hub in in a lot of places. So th- let's just come back to the different types of pitching though, because okay. uh, many listeners, including myself, as fiction authors, I, mm-hmm. I always feel like with fiction, it's a h- much harder pitch because let, look, let's face it, a library's going to order the top books from the top selling authors on the New York Times list. Like they, uh, that's mm-hmm. what people are going to pre-order in their library. And so mm-hmm. how do we break through that as independent fiction authors? Well, as fiction, I, again, I, I, here's what I did. I picked randomly 10 libraries and I went through and I read their collection development policies. And from that, one of the policies that I kept seeing over and over must be of interest. And so I said, okay, How do I prove my book is of interest? One of the ways I've done that is through library references. I reference other libraries that have purchased my book. But the other thing that I've done is I include some of my Amazon sales data to show how well my book is doing in the retail market. Because my thought process there is, okay, Miss Penn, librarian, you're unfamiliar with me. Here's where I believe my fictional book 
will fit in your library and would be of interest to your patients. And in addition, here's how well my book is doing on in the retail space with Amazon. Because that idea is that if my book is doing well on Amazon, they're patrons too. These some some of these people may be coming into your library. So I'm trying to make that connection as in, in whereby if the book is doing well in this space, I believe it will do well in your library space as well. That's how I'm marketing my nonfiction. And that's how I believe uh, you can market your fiction book. I think also perhaps we need to pick the nonfiction topics that are in the fiction. So if your YA book talks about bullying, for example, then maybe you you say my novel tackles the issues of bullying, or like you mentioned with civil rights, maybe my novel tackles issues of racism in society, or I've got one desecration, which is about the history of anatomy. Uh, Well, it's not about it. That's one of the underlying themes. So maybe I could pitch libraries that have more medical books or university libraries, or I don't know, just maybe Maybe that, that's another angle. That that is a that's a great idea. I think it's brilliant, actually, Joanna. And and then here's something that a, a, a librarian, a college librarian, told me. He said, "Eric, what?" You, and this was act for academic libraries. He said, "What you want to do is you want to show the librarian where your book fits in their library. So if it has some sociology orientation, you want to show that. If it's to your point, a fiction book." and you've got something in there about bullying, you want to put it in that category. So I've actually applied that to both academic and public libraries. So I think you touch on a good point, Joanna. If your audience for their fiction books can identify a segment that would be of interest to a librarian, in this case, I'll go back to using bullying as an example, that's what you want to pitch and show it where it would fit in the library. It would be in your fictional area uh, that may deal with books on bullying. Or it could be in your sociology book, because bullying has to deal with some impacts of sociology. But that's where I think the author has to try to make some decisions as to how they can align that book with their with the library's collection development policies because the closer you can make that alignment, the better your chances are of getting in, I feel. Oh, you're sparking lots of ideas now, for me, certainly. <laughs> what we're basically talking about now is pitching librarians as an industry. And I presume they have librarian conferences or they have librarian trade journals. So have you considered advertising or speaking at those types of events? I haven't, Joanna, because part of the, well, the the, the pandemic interrupted a lot of that, and Mm. that's starting to ramp back up. But before, I had not seriously considered that, but that is a great way to get in front of a large audience, and that's something that I probably will consider going forward. Mm, Yeah, because I was just thinking it might be cheaper to put an an ad, like a quarter paid ad page ad in a trade journal for librarians, which there must be such a thing. No, you're right. There are. There are. Yeah. This is not something that I've I've considered. One one of my big things is I've been trying to get my books to profitability. And one of the things that uh, has, and, 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 and believe it or not, libraries and then subsequent offspring of business that I've created has caused me, has helped me to get my books into the black. I'm, I'm running at about a 40.2% profitability with my library book business now. Mm. So I think in terms of, okay, where can I invest my dollars to get the greatest impact? And at, and, and early on, advertising was just not a part of my budget, but I'm at a point now where I can begin to consider such, Joanna. Yeah. Or if you ever think about doing a service for authors, you could have like a pitching service. You create your own Flamin thing with all the different books that people want to pitch libraries. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm actually I have a consulting service available on my website. Ah, I've actually had people ask me that, and yes, now I offer that as a part of my library marketing services. And that was the offshoot business that I mentioned. And here's what's interesting about that: I got that idea from you. Oh, good. When, when you, well, several two ideas that I've got from you that have proven big. One was going wide with my books and not being solely reliant on Amazon, and the other was 
looking for ways to enhance your books beyond selling the books directly. And I noticed you had begun to do audio books. You had expanded in the podcast. And so I asked myself, what could I expand into? And I said, when I wrote Getting Your Books in the Libraries, I said, well, you know, some people might like the book, but they may have questions. Why don't I offer my services for what I feel would be a reasonable fee? And I'll get on the phone or a Zoom conference with prospective authors, and we can go through how I pitch my books and develop individual strategies for those uh, authors. So yeah, I've created a business off of that. And that's what what has caused me to become profitable because I'm helping people either via uh, Zoom video conferencing or developing, helping them develop strategies on how to market their books to libraries. Oh, that is brilliant. I'm so pleased you're doing that because I feel this is such an underserved niche and yet such an important niche. So I love that you're doing that. And we'll link to that, uh, obviously, in the show notes. But tell everyone where they can find you and your website and your books and everything you do online. Uh, You can go to www.eseinc1.com backslash library dash marketing dash services. And there, all of my services and books are available. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time, Eric. That was great. Oh, Joanna, it's been an immense pleasure. I hope it's been beneficial to your audience. And uh, it's just been great to finally meet you and uh, to be a part of what you're trying to do to help others in the self-publishing arena. So I hope you found the interview with Eric interesting. And just to round up, you can get your eBooks into libraries through Draft to Digital, Kobo Writing Life and Publish Drive, your print books into libraries through Ingram Spark, and your audio books into libraries through Find Away Voices. If you want to help authors or in fact help yourself as an author, tell everyone to request books through your local library and hopefully over time we can spread the word about indie books in libraries. And remember, uh, patrons of libraries can get books for free and you still get paid. And of course, if you want to pitch libraries directly, Eric has databases and his sample letter and more help on his site. Links in the show notes. So next week, I'm talking to Brian Cohen, who many of you will know from the Sell More Book Show. Brian recently did a Kickstarter and has another one coming up. So I ask for his tips and lessons learned on crowdfunding. Plus, we talk about how his career has developed since we've known each other for around a decade now. And he has scaled various streams of income. So definitely a business discussion. In the meantime, happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.